Hello, my name is David Ermakora. Today I will talk about a gruesome topic named murder. This is the title of my presentation. So in a book I have just finished writing, I attempted to combine medical, forensic and historical folklore approaches. I examined a broad range of sources in which pointed objects such as needles, pins and nails are driven into a victim's head with malicious intent. The sources emerge from history, folklore and medicine in Eurasia from the Middle Age onwards. My method was simple. I gathered and discussed relevant documentation from history, medicine, folklore, and literature. I remain convinced that any comprehensive investigation of cultural traits needs to thread historical and more recent sources together. Particular attention was given in the book to infanticidal intracranial needles, the intentional insertion of needles and pins into an infant's brain in order to kill and to nail murders, reports of individuals being murdered by having nails hammered into their skulls. In both cases, sharp objects are used in acts of unexpected physical violence against the head, typically but not always ending in death. So needles in children and nails in adults. By tracing evidence of infanticide and murder from widely separate times and places, my aim was twofold. First, to uncover the known history of these pins, needles, and nails, documentation, in fact, is consistent through time but has gone almost completely unnoticed. And second, to demonstrate, quote, the interrelationship of social historical fact and the fiction of legend, unquote. We can speak, in fact, of a convergence of representations of intracranial needles and nail murders reflected in fictional and real accounts. As it is known, bodily experiences and literary or folklore ideas often meet tradition stems from experiential sources, while experience shapes tradition. I hope to show with this talk that this feedback loop occurs on many levels and that it carries with it a powerful emotional charge. So nail murders. In my book, I have argued that in studying the consistency of a given topic historically, it is necessary to explore all its aspects. This may vary more or less dramatically in terms of realism. A combination of reality and fantasy shows up in the so-called nail murder motif, which involves nail murderously inserted into the brain. This is a motif murder by driving nail through head. In 1977, two doctors published an article retailing the history of murder by nails being driven into the brain. This article, by the way, inspired the title of this presentation. This was followed in 1987 and 1999 by two studies on the same topic in Chinese literature and more recently in 2015 by an amateurish but thought-provoking comparative study on nails used as a fictional murder weapon. These works have all been a source of inspiration for me, while in my book I went much wider in geographical and historical terms. Sources describing nail murders are remarkably long-lived and widespread. Here I give only a few examples. During the siege of the fortress of Seringapatam by the British East Indian Company in 1799, say a dozen British soldiers were taken captive and put to death by Tipu Sultan, the ruler of the Kingdom of Mysore quote, in the most barbarous manner by having nails driven through their skulls, unquote. This was communicated in a letter. The source was an Indian prisoner. Apparently, the author of the letter himself could not fully credit the report. And when the bodies of the British soldiers were finally discovered, it was recorded that their bodies bore no marks of such method of murder. Contemporary newspaper reports and memories from the survivors of the bloody Kishinev pogrom of 1903, a turning point in Jewish history, have the rioters hammer nails into the brains of victims through the temple, highs or nostrils. It is unclear whether this was a form of torture on the living or a question of post-mortem mutilation. It is also uncertain whether there were multiple Jewish victims, including babies or just one woman. There are many similar dreadful modern reports from all around the world of individuals being killed by having nails driven into their skulls. The international and historical distribution of this method of murder suggests that it has been known widely and for a long time. Though, to what extent the murders were actually practiced and to what extent they were imagined is an open and fascinating question. 
often contemporary evidence for the hammering of nails into the brain emerged in places with social tension under military occupation, dictatorship, or in regions suffering from post-colonial violence, Tibet, West Bengal, Uganda, Malaysia, and so forth. In Zimbabwe and Nigeria, real nail murders are a traditional method for respectively killing suspected witches or meeting out popular justice on thieves. The earliest literally mention of nail murders is Jael's slaying of her husband's enemy, Caesar, as general of the Canaanite army judges in the Bible. Jael uses a hammer to drive a 10 pin through Caesar's temple while he's taking a nap in their private quarters. Quote, what would today be described as a severe penetrating traumatic brain injury, unquote. This is an ancient example of a fictional extrajudicial name murder that is an act of private but not secretive vengeance or a deception practiced under the guise of hospitality. So there are two passages in Judges. One is prose, the other is poetic. And uh, the poetic passage is slightly different, perhaps the result of a competing textual and oral tradition. The most notable difference is that in this poetic version, Caesarea seems to have been killed in standing position. Jael lured Caesar into her tent to overcamp him. The biblical passages have erotic connotation, but they are certainly not a grim parody of the sexual act. Judges brought together in a single impressive murder scene a cluster of themes involving seduction, treachery, violence, and the breaking of the law of hospitality. The episode generated a significant tradition of literary and artistic re-elaboration, late medieval nations, illustrated psalters, renaissance paintings, etc. It is important to note that there is no attempt to astutely conceal a name murder as a natural death in the biblical account. Concealment is often central, as we shall see in later intimate Western tales and Eastern as well, but he won't talk today about Eastern tales that is Chinese sources. The fact that Caesar is asleep, moreover, makes it easier to explain the man's passivity as the nail was hammered in. Think here of the association with Hakol in Victorian nail and scale legend, which I will examine soon, where a nail murder shows up, but where secrecy is an issue. Between the 16th and the 17th century, Sardinian ecclesiastical scholars associated jails named murder from judges with the so-called Passiones Clavorum. Several historical or pseudo-historical saints from Western Christendom, in fact, are said to have been put to death by the Roman authorities by having nails pounded into their skull and or other body parts. Religious narratives are extraordinarily inventive in conjuring up different ways to kill saints. In order to throw the martyrs a reason to relief, the authors of passions describe the most horrible torments their reality literature or their own imaginations can suggest. It seems that Romans did not use nails driven into the head as a form of capital punishment, nor do nail murders appear anywhere in Roman imperial laws. Nails do appear in the saint's devotional iconography. The saint's head is pierced by one or more nails, or the object is held in the hand. It remains to be determined when, how, and why the shocking nail murder motif was attached to this or that saint's passio. A matter that is too complicated to be discussed here, though in my book I single out a couple of representative examples. There were also medieval documents concocted to exaggerate the historical significance of certain Christian sites. Occasionally, they contained and murders. Again, nail murders were part of the stock of motives the saints, passiones, martyrum, were below. The imaginative theme of the noble death of the Christian faithful following persecution, torture, and execution can be conceived as the defining part of this literary genre. Among the famous victims, besides early Christian saints, of the lugubrious practice of dispatching someone by driving a nail through the skull into the brain, there is, for example, Pope Celestine V. Pope Boniface VIII was alleged to have cruelly commanded, for reasons of political ambition, the murder of his imprisoned predecessor Celestine in Celestine's cell. A nail was said to have been driven through the latter's head by Boniface's nephew or brother. Malicious rumors concerning Boniface's possible roles in Celestine's death existed from the end of the 13th century. 
In particular, the name murder is mentioned in the undated note following the text of a geographical compilation put together in the early 14th century, contained in a manuscript from the first half of the 15th century. The blessed Peter was killed in the said prison with a nail which was driven into his brain. The name murder idea entered Celestine's a geographic canon somewhat stably in the second half of the 15th century. A nail appeared among the relics of Celestine at the very end of the 16th century, while a hole is still visible at the top of Celestine cranium, something already noted the second half of the 15th century. A 1988 CT scan and two pathological evaluation, one conducted in 1888, the other in 2013, has suggested that the whole was produced after Celestine's death. We could be looking then at an attempt to align a relic with contemporary historical accounts and the horrific details of Celestine's death. There were apparently religious iconography alluding to Celestine and the nail stuck in the skull. The evidence now lost remained controversial. I will now deal with the nail in the skull legend. This legend has been independently examined by Moderman and by Young in an entry in his forthcoming book on Victorian urban legends. As we shall see, the nail murder appears as the core feature of the nail in the skull. I will now look at this complex of legends because it is all being first attested in the 16th or perhaps even in the 14th century. It was widespread. Versions emerged from several European countries and the US, and it shows how what might be called head nails arose great interest. The legend throws valuable light upon people's interest in strange or sensational news. Moderman and Young studied the presence of the nail in the skull in Britain circa 1750-1900s. Here, I will focus on two aspects of this body of folklore left to one side by them. Early modern references, yes, this is going to be legend hunting, and some interesting late French and Spanish literary rendition from the 19th century. Note that the nail in the skull legend is documented well into 20th century, we have here a Frisian variant, and that a literary nail in the skull version was included in a Swedish novel, in turn quoted in the 1977 seminal review of the medical and literary evidence on nail murders, the authors did not recognize folklore at work there. So, I will start with reality. Victims who suffer nail death while lying asleep are absent from rare medical legal descriptions of contemporary nail murders or attempted nail murders. These descriptions also suggest that in the rare cases when this form of murder is used, it is perpetrated by men. There are, for instance, Nigerian, Indian, Italian, and Swedish cases which might be grouped under the medical phrase of, quote, unusual craniocerebral injuries from nailing, unquote, also called by some jails syndrome. Although the hows and whys are not always clear, nails appear to be driven into the head of conscious, not somnolent female victims with homicidal intentions. This action includes the use of brute force. The victims are physically immobilized on the ground before having the nail driven into them. The victims, moreover, may survive. Sometimes more head nails are implanted. International fictional stories involving nail murders rarely describe male perpetrators. In my book, I offered a sample of these rare exceptions. One should contrast contemporary medical legal reality with folklore. A Nordic supernatural legend featuring nail murder has been indexed in the types of the Swedish folk legend. Uh, records come from South Sweden and date to the first half of the 20th century. There is a possibly related short horror story by a British writer on the supernatural, O'Donnell. Here follows a summary of this ghost story, uh, which is set in Germany in the Arts Island area. So the hero, a man, uh, desperate for a room for the night, takes refugee at the woman's house, and all she can offer him is the room in which her master passed away two days ago, and his remains have yet to be removed. The man, it is told, reluctantly accepts even when he discovers the big black coffin at the foot of his bed. During the night, the old man's gruesome hammer and nail murder is reacted in shadow play on the sailing. The vision of the ghostly hand hammering a nail later enables the man to indicate the murderers.
What is more, in 18th and 19th century Britain, there were many tales circulating about adults being murdered with a hammer and nail, most typically husbands murdered by their wives. This is Mareticide. This realistic story classed as international type uh, A to 960 D toed on the head of a corpse essentially illustrated the supposed vices of a woman, virtuous matrons responsible behind closed doors for lurid crimes. Sometimes the nail in the sky recounting events which took place in the distant past. For example, a source published in 1865, written according to the editor the century before, the year of the story was a 17th century ecclesiastic. Typically, uh, the nail in the skull legend runs as follows. I hear the detective, a doctor, a returning soldier, a pastor, etc., happens to pass through a graveyard where the sexton is digging a grave. The hero notices a moving skull and finds a small living animal, a toad, and heel, etc., concealed in it. This in turn leads to the discovery of a nail stuck in the cranial wall of the skull, often of an innkeeper, a guest in an inn, a blacksmith, a carpenter. At this point, the hero realized that the sharp instrument has been the cause of the man's death and decided, sometimes this is done by the sexton, to investigate further. The hero learns that the man had died suddenly while he was asleep or drunk and that he had a faithless wife who had subsequently married her lover, usually with unseemly haste. The lover, in some cases, is an accomplice. In others, he is the murderer. Finally, the hero confronts the murderer's wife, male lover who confesses, or the hero reports the crime to the authorities, witnesses are found, and so on. In either case, the killer is ultimately convicted and executed. Variants of this tale are well attested in the 18th century in Britain and Germany. They were included in place in Germany, which is interesting. The story had reached America by 1830 and the latest, and it shows up in the popular press, literary works, poems, sermons, oral tradition, etc. Here we have two drawings with the sexton, the skull with the hole, and the ear detective. So what is interesting, though, is that the nail in the skull legend first certainly appeared in writing in Britain in the late 16th century in the context of the English domestic tragedy. I won't talk here about the possible earlier medieval reference. Because of the presence of variants in Shakespeare and other Elizabethan stage writers, the legend has attracted the attention since the 18th century of many critics. The inclusion of the nail in the skull legend in a domestic tragedy focused on intrigue, murder, and discovery is not itself surprising given that this genre portrays, quote, the passions and crimes of ordinary folk in their everyday world. There is sensational crime, usually a murder associated with the breaking of marriage bonds, which provides the play's central incident, unquote. Much of the source material was taken from contemporary popular literature, which often emphasized the wickedness of the perpetrators to titillate the audience. The wicked and sometimes angry inclination of the female murderer's character is a recurring feature of modern renditions of the nail in the skull legend. Here we have like a, a Latvian legend. An apology for actors by the English playwright Thomas Haywood was published in 1612, but completed around 1608, to support contemporary claims for the positive role of theatre. At that time, Puritan attacks upon the stage, theatre, phobia, were common. For Haywood, plain going raises strong emotions that can force the audience to confront their own failings. To sustain the view, in his apology, Avood mentions two memorable anecdotes which demonstrate the revelatory power of drama by sharing, quote, a focus on the emotional trauma of a revelation affected by a dramatic representation, unquote. These two anecdotes, taken as examples of the moral and social efficacy of drama, are presented by Haywood as a strange, quote, accident happening at a play, unquote, which demonstrated the murder will how. Both the anecdotes feature wives who have put their husband to death and who confess their crime during a theater performance. In Haywood's words, theater can function as a means of social control as it enables diegetically the discoverers of many notorious murders long concealed from the highs of the world. Here I'm quoting Haywood, a stray demonstration of the instrumental benefits of theatrical performances. 
As we shall see, the narrative structure of this accident is common to other tales, and it concerns the player's performance representing a murder on stage. This provokes a young, respectable female spectator to react emotionally, revealing her guilty conscience. The woman suddenly cries out loudly in public and confesses in that very moment or after several days that she had committed a terrible crime in precisely the same way as the protagonist of the play she's watching. She had murdered her husband. One case, Haywood asserts us, happened at King's Lane in Norfolk before 1594. Poison was used, the husband hunted his former wife as a ghost and the murder remained secret for seven years. The other case took place in Amsterdam, Holland, and it is a nail murder. A wife drove a nail into her husband's head. In both accounts, the wicked woman is condemned after the woman confesses on seeing the events enacted. Haywood second anecdotes as a nail murder. Haywood explains that one day a well-known company of English comedians were acting in Amsterdam the last part of the Four Sons of Aimon, a drama which had been lost. It was mentioned, though, in a 16 historical record. In this drama, the penitent Renaldo lived like a common laborer in disguise, vowing as his last penance to carry burdens to a church that was being built. By reason of his stature and strength, Ronaldo did more work in a day than a dozen of the best laborers. The laborers, being put in a bad light, conspired amongst themselves to kill Ronaldo, waiting for some opportunity to find him asleep, which they might easily do since, quote, the sorest laborers are the soundest sleepers and the industry is the best preparative to rest, unquote. They decided to drive a nail into Rinaldo's temples, and Rinaldo immediately died. At this point, the nail murder story is told. Stories like Haywood's, in which, according to one commentator's happy formulation, there is the idea that, quote, theater can serve as a forensic tool, unquote, were well known in Britain around the same time. Indeed, history affords many other examples of crimes being discovered by the effects of acting. Stories about an adulterous member of the public who reacts emotionally and confesses her crime during the theater representation of a tragedy were not uncommon. Take the anonymous A Warning for Fair Woman, a play uh, published in London in 1599 based on the real-life murder of the merchant George Sanders in 1573 by his wife and her lover. This was a famous incident that was well published in contemporary chronicles, popular literature. Critics believe that a warning was written between the mid-1580s and 1599. We do not know the date of the play's first performance, but the play could have been staged as early as 1597. In a warning, there are two stories with two widows who confess their husband's murder after seeing a play that contains a similar scene. One is the earliest, admittedly short version of the nail in the skull that they have been able to find. And there is then the very same anecdote featuring a poison murder and the husband's ghost at King's Lane, which we already found in Highwood's apology with fuller details. The fact that the woman acted hoping to secure the affection of a younger man and the exact means of murder are not told in a warning. Claims that Haywood is the author of a warning on the basis of the shared tale are unconvincing. Quote, Haywood may have taken the anecdote from a warning or both the author of a warning and Haywood may have taken the anecdote from someone else. Quote, I totally agree with this interpretation. These uh, legends about spontaneous confessions from guilty playgoers who see their crimes depicted on stage were later alluded to in Shakespeare's Hamlet, written circa 1599-1601. Shakespeare was a contemporary of Haywood. So we have Hamlet Q1, published in 1603. The Q2 corresponding text, published in 1604-1605, is less detailed on the crime and is also, by the way, identical to the folio version of Hamlet of 1623. The play within the play dramatic device is important in Shakespeare's Hamlet and in other of his works too, such as Love's Lovers Lost and A Midsummer Night's Dream. In Hamlet, you will be remembered, the protagonist uses the staging of a tragedy called the murder of Gonzago to push his uncle, King Claudius, into revealing his guilt by watching Claudius' reaction. The thematic function of the anecdotes Shakespeare had heard is clear 
in Hamlet. There has been some chatter about how Shakespeare only alludes to these anecdotes, not giving the full versions as other dramatists. My preferred explanation would be that, quote, by this time it would have been tedious to retell in detail an old stage story, unquote familiar to both actors and the audience. The title page of A Warning for Fair Woman declares that the piece was acted several times by Shakespeare's company, the Lord Chamberlain's Man. Many scholars have noted that the story of the confession of the murderer's wife can be found in a German text, an anonymous adaptation of Shakespeare's Hamlet, part of the repertoire of the German itinerant theaters, tentatively dated to the mid-17th century. In Brudemort, Hamlet tells Horatio the following tale, which explains that, quote, comedians with their fiction often eat upon the mark of truth, unquote, a clarification only tangentially related to the main plot of the play. A woman from Strasbourg, Germany, murdered her husband by sticking a shoemaker's owl in the heart. Afterwards, with the help of her paramour, she buried the man under the threshold of her house. This crime remained hidden for nine years until some comedians came in the city and played a tragedy in which the same thing happened. The woman who was present at the play with her new husband began, quote, to cry out very loudly, her conscience being touched and screeched. Alas, that touches me, for I took the life of my innocent husband in this same way. She thus ran to the judge and confessed the murder. The wife's stories, quote, was found to be true, unquote, and she was executed after having repented of her sin. Indeed, the anecdotes uh, illustrative of the doctrine that the stage is useful in detective crime appears to have been Quote, hearsay, a common story, a theatrical commonplace, a well-remembered tale, or, in modern folklore terms, I say an urban legend which was familiar in that period to English playwrights and actors, and we might suspect the general public. Just think of the European-wide circulation of the Nail in the Skull legend in the 18th and 19th centuries. Legends are, of course, typically believed to be true. Think of Haywood who vaguely referred his readers to judicial records and living witnesses. The truth of the tale cannot be accepted without questions. This was observed by one commentator. It is telling that some modern commentators believe that these anecdotes were a telling of a single account founded upon an actual criminal fact. A woman convinced of murder, other scholars were more circumspect, asking whether this was not a possibility. Entertaining narratives about the psychological effects of tragic acting on the audience were fairly common in England until the 1800s, and interestingly, they included crimes being brought to light, murders in the case of the Nail in the Skull legend. Early modern tragedy and theatrical activity in general in the period was mentally engaging and a potently emotive cultural medium. Imagine now how well a nail murder would have worked on the stage, the outline, the hammer, the noise as the nail went in. There is in the background of all these accounts the broader questions of the process of theatrical catharsis in the Elizabethan age. The emotional release of the Elizabethan audience was, it has been suggested, facilitated by their relationship with the characters in the play and the audience's consequent reflection upon their own lives, as if they were standing in front of a mirror. It has been observed, in fact, that anecdotes about the play within the play hint at a sympathetic equivalence between theatrical performances, historical reality, moral efficacy, and emotional and passionate engagement. Stage plays had lasting and salutary effects when viewers identified themselves with the actors and the narrated events. The play's ability to trouble the conscience is what matters here. The power of tragedies to move, say, uh, was a sign that the performance was efficacious. Compassion, gear, remorse, sorrow, pity, sickness, and tears are the most recurrent psychological effects of domestic tragedy on 17th and 18th century spectators in, for example, England, France, and Germany. This brings me to the motive of confession in the Elizabethan tales where the name murder shows up, Haywood a warning. There has been much scholarly speculation in the context of the moral catharsis, I'm quoting here, of the Elizabethan age, where confession is primarily seen as a cultural concept and a social ritual taking place in the self, a reflectively performative space. 
Speaking of narrative, in Haywood, a wording and related nail in the skull legend, the presence of a nail in the skull is not sufficient proof. In almost all the versions, the wife and or lover collapse morally when confronted with the nail, thus confirming their guilt. The collapse and subsequent self-confession seems to suggest an underlying sense of guilt rather than remorse tout court. Moreover, the public confession of the wife while watching the play is unexpected. There is a sense of wonder and it prepares the way for her second, less elusive confession at the end of the tale. On the other hand, the nail in the skull legends attested from the 1750s onwards only focus on the empirical investigation leading to the woman's full confession, hence their similarity to detective fiction as we shall see. There is no reason, I believe, to look for an evolution here from earlier supernatural remorse to logic detective work. In Nail in the Skull Legends, the particular of the small animal, Todd Hill, moving inside the skull, surely represents divine intervention, albeit a low-grade entertaining type of the same. This is expressly stated, for example, in a morally oriented reappropriation of the story published in a Catholic American book in 1904. While all these narratives, Elizabethan and modern, are based on the proverbial doctrine that murder will out, the motor of the whole plot. The murder will out has been previously detected in a range of sources, English crime pamphlets and murder sweetheart ballads. It is difficult to know why the motive of the surprised hysterical self-confession of the guilty woman while watching a play does not show up in later Nail in the Skull legends. Is it because the social and educational role of the theater in the 18th and 19th century decline, or is it just a matter of chance? The fortunate emergence of variants of the tale among a specific social group in a precise historical moment, we can speak of professional folklore, Elizabethan authors writing for or about the theater. For sure, virtually all the early modern versions of the tale of the adulteress confessing her murder, thanks to the revelatory power of tragedy, have an English background as they were a well-established boost of Elizabethan actors. There is Haywood Shakespeare who only alludes to it, while it can be assumed that the Brudemort goes back to a piece written by English comedians with Shakespeare's Hamlet in mind from the early 17th century. The piece was important to Germany, shortened, translated, and further adapted for performance according to the distinctive feature of the German traveling stage, straightforward narratives, body accented planning, and so on. The relationship between the Brudemort and the nail in the skull tale circulating the following two centuries in Germany remains, however, to be explored. It has been overlooked by scholars just as nobody compared Victorian nail in the skull legends to Haywood, Shakespeare, etc. An additional folklore argument is that urban legends, as migrating stories, inevitably tend to become tied to local regional place names and characterizations. As I said, the German variant from the Brudemort was likely borrowed from an English source. The narrative then could already have been in England when the German play was first translated from English in the early 17th century. The location was moved to Strasbourg, then part of the German states, in order to bring the event closer to the German public. But that was not all. While the gruesome story was clearly appealing for the public, it also matched one of the main didactic purposes of German itinerant theater, that is the representation of sins and sinful consequences with the aim of warning the audience. If we switch our attention to the modern evidence for the nail in the skull legend, we find the plot in France in Le Clou, written in 1831 by Lucas. Le Clou was a successful short story which was reprinted several times in the 19th century. At the end of the story, the homicidal wife goes mad and the second husband is killed in a pistol duel. In Britain, there is evidence that the nail in the skull legend circulated orally around 1833 as a real incident. This helps to explain, perhaps, the presence of the tale in contemporary canard, a form of street literature chapbooks dealing with sensational crime news. We know that Luca one day heard a canardieu crying out in the street in order to attract a crowd. The plot of, quote, his fantastic tale, which originally came out from his imagination. 
it was presented as a recent criminal outrage. The headline note was likely a long title from a printed broadsheet booklet. Uh, Luca, one understands, was surprised. We do not know whether the anecdote was told to the biographer by Luca himself and whether Luca was aware that he had composed this literary work which first brought him to public attention around a pre-existing legend he had heard or read. Did Luca lie in attempting to protect his reputation? Did he really hear a canardieu shouting the story out? In any case, the nail in the skull was worth sharing with its roughly sketched characters, its suspense, clue hunting, and the gothic but still realistic details. The night tempest, the gloomy bells, the horrific death, the visit to the cemetery, and so on. It has often been suggested that Luca was the inspiration of the main influence of De Alarcón, who wrote in 1853 a short novel entitled El Clavo. This work is sometimes cited as the first instance of Spanish detective fiction, or at least is proposed to be a harbinger of the same as the tradition emerged in the early 1900s. El Clavo was revised in 1856 and 1944 it was represented in a romantic drama film. And we find in El Clavo the by now familiar details inserted into a literary frame. There is a mysterious woman who drives a nail into her husband's head while he's asleep. Not a single drop of blood spills out from the hoon while the object is concealed under the man's hair. There is also the visit to the cemetery by an investigator, here a judge, the presence of the sexton, the accidental and macabre discovery of a nail stuck in a disinterred skull leading to a subsequent murder investigation, and so forth. In his autobiographical Historia de Mis Libros, De Alarcón stated that this story, quote, was referred to me by a certain magistrate from Granada when I was very young, unquote. Is this another example of the oral circulation of Nail in the Skull legend? The use of Concelebre in De Alarcón's title linked the story with French narratives of actual court cases. This suggested to the reader that he or she was reading a retelling of an actual murder from the writer's day. A commentator even ventured, quote, a real murder which took place in Paris at the beginning of the 19th century, unquote. The absence of real names and mentions of specific places in which the events occurred in El Clavo, note, is not itself decisive in discounting this theory. It is possible to say that De Alarcón could have just forgotten the detail as he claimed to have written his novel many years after he had first heard the story from the magistrate. Alternatively, perhaps he just enjoyed making the story generic and timeless. One early commentator guessed for very understandable reason that both Luca and De Alarcón independently took advantage of a cause célèbre in their storytelling. Another scholar wrote sardonically that Leclou, quote, turned everyone's brain upside down, crossed the Pyrenees, became Spanish, El Clavo, turned French again, metamorphosed into a canard as a real crime case. The same fantastic tale written by Luca, who tried in vain to decide the gullible public. Gothic romantic fiction of the 19th century was heavily influenced by vernacular narratives. In this context, the European wide circulation of the nail in the skull legend suggests that it influenced Luca in France, the Alarcon in Spain, and several other British authors too, who published poems and elaborate literary works based on this urban legend. There is no reason for thinking that these writers relied on a cause célèbre, or for that matter, on each other. The most economical explanation is that there was a common pool of folklore that they all drew upon. There are recent work, two among many, uh, which study Le Clou and El Clavo in the context of learned literal influences, imitation, and so on. Thank you.